All right, we're live. We're live. Hi. Hello. Hello to Vienna, to Bogota from California Desert. And I'm hello. Gonna... Hi, Victoria. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Locasio. Uh, I'm in Vienna, Austria. I'm an artist here, and it is my sincere pleasure to be hosting the Alien Stardust Talk tonight with um, Victoria Vesna, my mentor. She's a media artist, a peacemaker, a meditator, and an environmentalist. Um, she studied fine arts at the University of Belgrade in Serbia, went on to do her PhD with one of my personal heroes, Roy Ascot, who was a pioneer in telematics. She is a professor in design and media arts. Um, she's on the faculty at the University of California in Los Angeles and the director of the Art Sci Center of the School of the Arts and the California Nanosystems Institute, CNSI in Los Angeles. Um, and she is, as I mentioned before, a media artist working interdisciplinary and absolutely concerned with the environment and the world around us. Um, her work is interdisciplinary and is creative research. So I was able to join Victoria and her art side team for Ars Electronica this year, the Telluric Vibrations Gardens, um, and met her a few years ago when we worked on the Hawk Zodiac project together here in Vienna. Um, interestingly enough, I was there for the Alien Stardust installation, which is still currently going at the Natural History Museum here in Vienna. Um, and we were there at the installation just a couple days before everything shut down for COVID here in Vienna in March. Mm -hmm. So that was then and here we are now together on zoom at this amazing festival thank you sir atomica for hosting us and welcome victoria thank you malika the pleasure is all mine really to to be doing this with you and daniela and also thank you to juan who i haven't met but he's been helping on the side and natalia definitely um, it's it's wonderful because I actually wanted to participate at Suratomica a while back and because of travel and conflicts wasn't able to. So the plus side of this uh, pandemic is that we're building a community that's uh, much broader and in many ways inclusive. A lot of people who normally wouldn't be able to travel for economic reasons or even visa reasons, um, now suddenly we can connect and it kind of is an equalizer too because Suratomica was not so visible and now it's really uh, has the possibility and potential to be right up front. The, the lectures I've heard so far and workshops are amazing. I'm definitely going to share that with my students uh, who just started teaching. And one of the things that um, I'd like to share with everybody is uh, this idea of borders and dust and, and the idea of the aliens. So Alien Stardust is a very layered project that happened because it wanted to happen. So I have this belief that ideas um, are these kind of floating um, manifestations of many different events and people and consciousness that come together and look for who can now make them manifest for whatever reason. So I initially had no interest even in meteorites in particular. I mean, yes, sci-fi like everybody else, but um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a background and then we can talk about it. How does that sound? Sounds great. So, I really want to do this also because I think it's important to share with uh, the audience the fact that we are uh, engaged in um, art-based research, which is really important to, um, to stress uh, as far as talking about art and science and how these worlds collide, connect, and why it is important to recognize 
that art-based research has a huge benefit to the sciences. Uh, in fact, mentioning uh, Roy Ascot, he actually said, don't ask what science can do for art, ask what art can do for science. And it really is at that point when complexity is happening. So come back to 1969, when it was the first time ever that we saw as a humanity, our planet. And this is when also there was uh, Vietnam going on, a lot of upheaval, a shift in consciousness. Uh, and Woodstock, of course, was happening when this song uh, from Joni Mitchell uh, came out. And actually, she couldn't attend, funnily enough. So this song was her kind of way of participating. And I took a little bit of it because it really says so much, and she was in her early 20s when she left this mark. So yes, we are all stardust, and yes, we are all carbon, and we are golden, and we are in the devil's bargain, and we do have to get back to the garden. So this, uh, also the fact that Arts Electronica, after 40 years of being a festival, when they got shut down, they came up with this idea of Kepler's Gardens, which I thought was so appropriate and, and uh, really kind of our next uh, level. So the way the project started was not at all with my gravitating towards micromedia rights or media rights at that point. Christian Coverell, who was the director of the museum at that point, uh, I met with while I was working on the planktons and noise aquarium with Dr. Alfred Wendel and Martina Fruschel. So I spent a lot of time in Vienna. I was also there in residence and I have a community there. I actually miss it. Um, but uh, he asked me, why don't you do something with media rights? And I would go and I love the museum and I had a chance to look through different media rights, but I had no idea how to approach it. The one thing that bothered me is that they were just sitting in these uh, cases as, as rocks and I really missed the motion and the sound and everything else that kind of slamming into the earth. But I started thinking about it and, and researching a little bit. And the breaking moment for me, you know, inspirationally, was to find out about Stardust. So Stardust is, uh, 70 to 100 tons of this material falls on Earth every day, which is incredible uh, if you think about it. And uh, to make people aware of this became really interesting to me. But as I was looking and researching about Stardust, I discovered very quickly that it mixes with a lot of pollution. And it became a kind of a... a metaphor for how we're part of this huge cosmic beautiful system but because of all the pollutants whether they're uh, mind pollutants or physical pollutants or actually chemical we don't see it we're not aware what's going on so i had the luck to be invited to uh, as part of a residency at ecole polytechnique at the Sirta part of the uh, useful fictions of, uh, workshop that was organized by uh, UC San Diego. And there I learned more and more and I worked with students about dust and actually found it quite shocking uh, what we're inhaling. So the idea of uh, micromedia rights and hunting for micromedia rights um, it became super interesting because as you're looking for micromedia rights, you're actually discovering this incredible complexity of dust. And I have been told in the past, you're allergic to dust. So this was another kind of level of interest for me. What does it mean to be allergic to dust, really? Like, which dust? There's many, many different particles. It's, it depends on the environment. It depends on where you are. It depends on which wind is blowing which way. So here is Daniela on the roof of the Natural History Museum uh, looking for dust with me. And she just came into the, into the talk. So perfect timing, Daniela. Uh, so we have a, it's a very simple process, actually. You have a, a, this nice, strong uh, um, magnet. And Ludwig 
Carrier is here. He's an in-house scientist researcher uh, from France originally who works at the museum. He was very generous with his time and he actually looked for dust with us. Uh, we went up on the roof a few times and here we actually went under the microscope and looked at a dust uh, collection that took us no more than half an hour. So we just did something quick, let's test it. And what you're seeing is hair, textile fibers, lichen, um, in this slide, then here we have Saharan dust. So here we are in Vienna and there wasn't even a plume of Sahara, but it gets ingrained in everything else. So here it's mixed with other pollution that you would have to have a little more time to figure out what it is. Uh, and here you, you see that little red dot. I was asking, what is that? Well, that's microplastic. And this, of course, is really frightening when you think about the fact that this is floating around also in something that we're not only ingesting with water by microplastics dissolving into our oceans and seas, but it's also in aerosols. So to look at these particles became really, really interesting to me and to also think about how they relate. And just quickly conceptually, and then I want to talk to um, Monica and Daniela a little bit more about art-based research. Um, I started thinking, well, okay, so it has to be site-specific because I'm in this museum and in this incredible meteorite collection. Uh, what do I do? And I thought, all right, I'll ask. Uh, Dr. Coverell and, and Ludovic Ferrier to pick out seven meteorites, which would be from one from each continent. And there was actually a debate whether there's six or seven continents. <laughs> it's a separate story. We're taught seven, European is taught six. Um, so we have, we picked these out very quickly. This one fell in Morocco, uh, so it's Africa and it's Tissant and it actually fell from Mars. This was a pretty spectacular fall relatively recently in 2013 in Chelyabinsk, Russia. And this is this palisite fell in China. This fell in Australia and it's all iron. And a lot of these you don't even know where they come from, but these rocks fell from outer space. And then we have this huge canyon uh, here in New Mexico, Canyon Diablo. Now notice in these slides, you have the rock, but then you have the slice of the rock. And this became super interesting to me to how gorgeous and interesting it is. The, the shape of the rock, I find out is actually shaped by the speed and the sound of passing through the space, which is also pretty incredible. Um, this was South America, Campo de Cielo, and I was very happy to have received some of that uh, rusted um, meteorite to look through myself. So I'll end there this bit. We can talk about it and then I'll start sharing a little bit where the project went from that point on. But this was just very briefly for the audience uh, to, to get a sense of how an invitation comes to you that you don't, so you're not necessarily as an artist looking for this. In other words, I wasn't. But out of curiosity and just thinking about it and, and it keeps coming back into my consciousness, I started looking at sci-fi, I started looking at NASA as they're going online. I went to this um, Ecole Polytechnique workshop to look at pollution and how that's detected with LIDAR and lasers and different ways that it's looked at. And one of the things that struck me is that every place, Paris in this instance, they look uh, at Paris. So they have the slice of sky where they're looking for alien dust to come in. And then they announce, oh, there's dust coming from a volcano. There's dust coming from uh, whatever, so alert. Um, and I thought that was so amazing and crazy in many ways because it travels so much. And yes, there's stations around the world who are sharing this information, but you can imagine. So the thing came, uh, it became a lot about borders and, and the fact that 
the whole thing about borders that are coming up now, especially in this country, but also quite true for a few countries in the Europe area, um, they're just this human manifestation of the whole problem. Because we, in 1969, we saw ourselves as an Earth. Now we see so much more of space and Mars and all the different explorations. To, to have that narrow mind and to, to insist on this narrow way of thinking is what's creating actually so many problems. And really, to bring it back to the present moment, the only way that we can solve pandemics like the one we're in is if it's thinking of the planet. Otherwise, we all just have to be locked down forever. It makes no sense. Think even of climate change, it's the same exact problem. We're here in California, there's, I think, 700 fires that have been burning in the last two months, which is mind blowing. And there's days when the dust and the air quality is so bad that we can't go out of our house at all. Forget the pandemic, you can't go out anyway. So it's all about breath. It's all about the fact that even when you're thinking of the social unrest, it was, I can't breathe. I mean, the whole thing is about that. And the fact that suddenly the air was clear and we're notified, oh, you know, the PMQ is just 60 or 30, amazing. What happened? It's in Europe. So it's like, why isn't anybody paying attention? You know, this is such a circulating world of water, air, earth, all of it is just so obviously middle school chemistry and connected. So to, to talk about a little bit between us, because we shared all of us in our work and our opinion, the fact that we really need to address as artists complexity and how to deal with a lot of scientific reductionism that in some instances is necessary. Nothing against reductionism. If you have to narrow in on a molecule, you have to narrow in. But how do you narrow in on a molecule and at the same time are able to see the complexity. I think this is where our work comes in. So what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, hi, Daniela. It's so great that you're here. <laughs> Daniela was just at the Leonardo um, laser talk and just finished over there and now has joined us here. Um, yeah, I think everything you're speaking to, Victoria, the complexity of everything, yet having to narrow in on things, having to work um, globally and community wise all over the place to solve some of these bigger issues, it all really speaks to collaboration and how we're able to collaborate and how we're able to bring our, um, you know, diverse interests and abilities together to solve large problems. But it's also how you work and how many artists and artistic research work is collaboratively. Um, and I'd love if you could speak to us a little bit about your collaborative style, because, um, Speaking from experience, the first time we worked together is I had the opportunity to collaborate with you on your Hawk Zodiac, and it was a very different experience than um, other times I've been able to collaborate uh, with um, uh, artists. So if you could speak to that a bit. How was it different for you? Before I say anything, I'm actually curious. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I was a um, second year student at the Angevante here in Vienna, and you were a um, superstar artist coming in for this exhibition. Um, but rather than kind of top down direction of what was supposed to happen, you really um, took into account all of our opinions and we really worked together. It was an incredible process. Um, so you really did work collaboratively with collaboratively with us and I think that that takes a lot of trust and a lot of um, um, yeah a lot of trust when you're working as a team so I'd love to hear about that if you can are you still with us Victoria looks like she might be frozen Daniela do you want to speak to that a little bit maybe we can get her back on yes do you hear me can you hear me yeah. Okay. Um, I I also have the feeling that working um, with an artist like Victoria that has been collaborating with so many different disciplines for such a long time 
makes a big difference um, because, bec well, first of all, the trust thing that everything uh, is accepted and every comment is uh, looked at. Uh, but not only that, it is. I I, I want to make a, like I I want to really say again a word that you used and that Victoria used and that is so important for us as well in Suratomica and it is complexity and in a in a in a uh, artistic piece or artistic project or investigation as complex as the ones uh, that Victoria makes like this one like uh, Alien Stardust or the or or the hoax uh, dinner that you worked on um it is important to contemplate every single piece of it. It is important to see uh, what is there and whoever has to comment on it. Uh, and it is completely uh, independent of your uh, discipline or your academic knowledge or, you know, it is important to regard it as, as, as one piece and as one uh, project. So every, uh, comment is very welcome and i think um now victoria is unfortunately uh, i think gone for for, like, for some <laughs> seconds more but i think you and me we can both agree on on that we can both agree on how important it is for this kind of art and science projects and ideas uh, that are super complex and that have so many layers to take mm -hmm. into account um the, the different opinions and the different uh, ways of doing and ways of pro producing and uh, thought processes and, um, you know, like uh, thought teams, because I, I don't want to uh, exclude like people that are not uh, academics or stuff, like every kind of thought is welcome and important to the project. Absolutely. I mean, especially when you're dealing with complexity, I think there's always this binary of forces in anything. You know, we're talking about the universe and stardust. There's always this um, push and pull. Um, and when something is so complex, it is often important to ask the kind of stupid questions or the basic questions and um, be in the same room and, and taking into account um, information from everywhere. Um, yes. And that also has to do, I think something Victoria um, talks about a lot is also kind of beginner's mind and clearing your mind and being there for whatever shows up um, and not having this kind of rigid, maybe academic or egotistical block to others' ideas or other ways of being or feeling or thinking. So, um, yes. somehow, you know, as humans, we want to, to narrow our focus and be very um, specific and um, intentional about complexity and we have to figure it out and narrow it down but maybe the best way to deal with it is to really open it up mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, talking about it in the in the last uh, conversation I was having like the importance of uh, what what Victoria was talking about like the importance of some kind of positive reductionism if I can call it like that mm -hmm. uh, like there is a plus side of knowing everything about the atom or everything about one uh, specific particle and everything about it, but the beauty of that knowledge and the beauty of, of, of having that um, reduced, like, I don't want to say reduced in like small, but reduced in like focused uh, knowledge is to share it. And to say, hey, I have this I have this uh, piece of meteorite. What can we What can we um, do with it? You know, and that is exactly what this project was also about. And what I wanted to say before, when Victoria was uh, talking about the looking at it, looking having to look at the whole uh, planet to be able to to eliminate or I don't know, eliminate is not the correct word, but you know what, I, what I'm uh, meaning, uh, this pandemic and this fear and everything that we're going through right now is to look at it as a complex system, like look uh, out to the cosmos like Victoria is doing and the, 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 
the waste of the cosmos not being a part of this planet. So uh, now we can we can take a sample of <laughs> dust in the subway in Vienna, and we can find uh, every kind of uh, element in it. And of course, we can find uh, the virus. Probably, you know. Vienna is growing exponentially as well on the on this virus uh, thing. So we could find it. And then you read uh, in the news, which is also amazing for this topic, how it is, um, where it's coming from. Like, you know, that the numbers of people that are infected are going up. And then somehow we know where it came from. So each, if I understand correctly, we can even read the DNA of the, the virus of each one of the of the of the persons. So yeah, it is moving in the in the planet, and it is crossing borders, and it is uh, like just like this meteorite dust. It is just flowing in the in the, in in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's crossing every kind of limit from the from the a cosmos to the to the planet and then to each person and then under the skin and then it crosses the limit of our lungs and we you know so it is extremely complex and extremely uh, deep the, the the how how much this tells us about the current times and how much it tells us about how to uh, get out of what we're going through how, yes, you know, like how, how to help, how to make a difference. And that's super beautiful. Absolutely. All right, I'm looking down. I'm just trying to get Victoria back connected to us. She should be back on in just a minute. Maybe Daniela, you can tell us, because um, you helped Victoria install the alien stardust at the Naturhistorisches here in Vienna. You were there for the entire install, kind of a right hand lady. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yes, did Victoria share some pictures of the exhibition yet? She shared some pictures of the meteorites there, but not the exhibition yet. Yes, unfortunately, I don't have them here. Um, but uh, it was it was a really cool experience. I have been, I have collaborated twice now with this project with the uh, Natural History Museum. The first time was the, with the mineralogy department and now um, with the meteorites. And these are two departments that are amazingly um, deep and beautiful and uh, very scientific, very uh, co like, um, concentrated on the matter on the what what they have like the study i studied this rock i studied this mineral i studied this meteorite but it is also deeply poetic if if you talk to them and if you go and look at each uh, part of, of the exhibition at the museum um so working with victoria was super uh, intense uh, we she she had uh, some micro meteorites printed in 3D printers uh, in a mar much larger size. So each micro meteorite, I think it's about three picometers, or I don't know. Hi, I was just telling um, Monica about how it was to work with you uh, on the NHM exhibition. Uh, and I was saying that it was super interesting to in, interesting to work with uh, in collaboration with um, the meteorologist. Uh, yes, it, yes, it's it's uh, I I say it like that. <laughs> so um, and I was telling uh, Monica about the prints of the meteorites that you did. So we installed them in a room so people could go in and look at micrometeorites in a much larger size. Uh, there is also um, a microscope with some dust from the that we that we gathered. Uh, so if somebody wants really wants it, they could uh, look for micrometeorites in that uh, dust. Although um, Ludovic told me specifically that he thinks there is no micrometeorite in that uh, small uh, sample of dust. Um, and, 
sorry? The pessimist. Yes, he is. He is. <laughs> but uh, something really important as well was the sound, because Victoria recorded sound uh, that also crossed these geographical frontiers of this of the seven um, continents where she actually uh, where, where, where the meteorites uh, were found. So you hear some um, sounds from, from like a market and you know that it could be North Africa. And then you hear some sounds like um, mechanical sounds that you know could be from the ones you hear from uh, the International Space Station or something when you look at a video. So sound also took you on the on the trip uh, around the seven continents that uh, where, where where those meteorites were found, um, and it was that was uh, the the installation. It was I I don't know if it's uh, still going, but it is really beautiful. Ah, Victoria was uh, I think sharing. Um, the video. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so these are the seven different meteorites that were chosen from the collection. And then this is the micrometeorites. Do you hear me okay? Yes. This is the micrometeorites that we were basing it on. And here you can actually see a sand particle that's enlarged and this is a micrometeorite that we don't know where it's from that uh, fell in Europe. Uh, this is North America, it's a piece of pollen dust particle. Uh, here we have uh, Antarctica foss fossilized pollen, another kind of pollen piece but it's fossilized. And then um, what we have here is coal. Uh, actually, I should do this full screen, right? So what we have here is coal. And then uh, the, the idea is that each one, each um, particle comes to you, so you have kind of a sense of it. Here we have the famous coronavirus now in, Je in March, it was just starting to get into people's minds. Um, and then we have all these different micrometeorites who are, that are blown up and shown. So just briefly, I'm showing this to give you a sense of the visualization, which uh, was done with Eli Jotova and um, Deborah Isaac, who both were my students at some point, and now we work together. So what we had was seven meteorites and the idea of microbe and nano and pollution and how each one actually drops into a particular part of our planet and you have these different elements that come in so the, just to show one as an example and you saw the saharan dust on the roof of the museum this actually fell from mars and then we mix it up with these other elements and you can see also here the satellite tracks of how this saharan dust uh, moves now what's really important in the global ecology is that this dust actually fertilizes Amazon. So a lot of people don't realize that there's many different reasons how this moves through the earth, but when it's out of balance, dust can actually carry viruses and bacteria. And in fact, it's proven that it carries uh, SARS virus and quite, quite possibly carries the COVID virus. So that um, gives you a little bit more of a sense. Now, what I would like to also show very briefly, and all of this is online, is how this evolved into a meditation. So what we're looking at is uh, from a perspective outside of the earth, where we approach a meteorite. This one actually is the one that fell 
on Europe in Chelyabinsk based on the meteorite we saw in the gallery at the Natural History Museum. And our meditation is about how when everything falls apart, we stay still, we stay centered, we stay in our peace, mostly because we have to be responsive and we have to we, we have no guide, guidelines on how to operate under these circumstances when we're dealing with a pandemic, climate change, and political upheaval. It's a lot for us to handle. And to go from, from a continent to continent and drop with these rocks and meteorites and mix with the pollution that's moving upward as the meteorites are moving downward, was the idea and in the museum itself we and this is where both of you were there to help actually we set up four pedestals that we got in the basement and this was um, the idea here with the micrometeorites was that they represent the four corners of the wor world which is the americas in the west europe in the north asia in the east and africa in the south and these micrometeorites are presented in this installation. Uh, <clears throat> really, really important part of the installation, what I jumped in when Daniela was talking, is sound. And the sound actually and frequencies are critical in my work. And I will even talk about collaboration in relation to sound. I, even though I was taught as a fine artist and painter, I dropped out of school and at, at a certain point and formed a band. And this is really how I like working as, as a group of people that come together and want to create frequency, music, sound, images together. So this is again from the roof where we were capturing the sounds. And there's in the meditation, there's layers of sound that now uh, happen. So you have the COVID-19 data that comes from the Washington University, which then is programmed by John Brumley, who uh, puts it into the meditation as a constant because we're all constantly hearing this. Then you have the drone sound, which is um, composed by Paul Geluso in New York, that is also constant, and that's the healing sound. That's the sound that's based on sulfagia and harmonic frequencies that overlays on top of the COVID anxiety. And you're in your meditation, you're actually guided to follow the drone sign, to stay with it. And then we have the sounds of space that come to us from ESA and NASA and different samples that we have, which uh, Clinton and Ar Armin and uh, Ivana Dama, who are students in design media arts, actually helped me pull together and have it as a track. And finally, we were joined by Rihanna Catalyst, who uh, is the voice, kind of a celestial voice that leads us through it. So this is again from the museum. You see here the kind of interplanetary observation network that brings in these sounds. And I wanted to make it much more palpable, much more um, something that you can feel and send. You hear okay? Do, do you hear the sound okay, or should I reshare it with the sound? I guess is my question. I could hear it okay. It was a little choppy. A little choppy. Okay. I'll come back in. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of a sound. going to go through it, but I do want to mention what happened. And Daniela was there, and so was Monica, the day before, after the opening, 
I went to the museum because everything closed down and it was quite a kind of a creepy moment to be honest because I was alone in the museum there they, they gave me special permission if you hear the sound the sound is creaking uh, floor and you're moving through this space with all these artifacts and everything just came to a standstill so the exhibition then would have been seen not at all for months and even now it's under a lot of restrictions right as, as it should be uh, when you enter you also see a microscope with dust from the roof that you can take a look at it gives you a little bit of a explanation of what you're seeing and then you enter this installation that kind of mimics uh, the way the Media rights are presented outside, but it's a little more mysterious. And and then the sound is, is really dominant. And you're seeing the animations on the sphere. Now the thing about the the sphere that was interesting to me is that it actually was used uh, for. for um, just stop here. It was used to show the planet Earth and how the planet Earth uh, is affected globally. It was actually called the Gaia Room, which I also loved. But I really wanted to make a point of moving out of the Earth-centric viewpoint and think about how we, with our minds, can come from outer space. So to come back to sound and visualize it for the audience for a little bit, this is the series, the software that we got for the COVID data. So it actually processes it in real time. And it really creates a kind of a sound that's anxiety provoking. And then we have the sulfagio, the drone sound, which is also constant. And then we have the, the sound, the voice. And then uh, the sounds from space. So this is us, and it should be noted that each one of us is in a different location. So you just saw the sounds produced. But we're actually working from five locations in real time and we're connecting to people who signed up to be part of it. It actually was a pretty exhilarating process, I must say, that I'm very interested to continue working with because it's exactly what we're doing now. So if you think about it, you have Monica, Daniela, Natalia uh, in, in um, Vienna. I'm in the desert in California. And Natalia is where? In Bogota. There you go. <laughs> so it's a similar kind of thing. I, I think it's um, it's really made me try to go with the positives of this disconnect and to use this moment where the oceans have quieted down, people are forced to be a little bit quieter or not moving as much, let's put it that way, 
Um, but we're bombarded by different things. We're bombarded by media and we're bombarded by pollution. So we're actually more aware of, uh, as at least I am, of climate change. And for instance, the oceans are um, quieter, so less noise pollution, but much, much more plastic pollution because of the one-time use of masks and gloves the, the, all around the world. It's just crazy how much of that is going on. So it's an interesting moment to really think about how artists and scientists can think of getting away from what we consume, how we consume, and the whole business model of consumerism to create new ways of thinking and circulating because we have to circulate and we're group animals. We have to work with the whole ecology. Um, and yeah, so sorry about dropping out, but that's part of it too. I don't even stress about it anymore. <laughs> I don't even see myself. Do you guys see me? No. no. It's weird. <laughs> but anyway, I'll stop it and start it and see what happens. Yeah, it's strange. So I'm curious, um, Victoria, you've done many projects with VR and visualization and sound. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, this might be the first uh, big project where you really brought the entire thing and moved it into a meditation. Um, can How did this go from an installation to a meditation as a, as a project? To me, it's always been, uh, my meditation has always been my practice and uh, creating interactive works where I make people slow down and actually uh, have an inverted interaction, if you will, has always been part of my practice. Uh, it's just more overt, more obvious, more deliberate now because I think it's really necessary. And uh, it, I'm really being called to just actually call it that so that people who are attracted or invited come to it with that in mind that we will slow down and we will talk uh, in a different way. But, you know, going back to Nano Mandala, I worked with Tibetan monks. Uh, the blue morph was all about metamorphosis of a chrysalis to a butterfly and meditating in space uh, publicly, if you will. <laughs> um, and any work that I did, including what was in the gallery, I feel that we all as artists create work that in a sense is a meditation you know you want to pull the person in whether it's carbon and bottles of carbon and the person starts thinking about and moving into a different mind space um so it's, it's just being more overt it's actually not changing it and it was very easy for me to shift because the thinking and the mind process behind it doesn't change. It's just the delivery and the medium that changes. And it's actually quite exciting and interesting to think that you can collaborate across the oceans and even do this across the ocean, even though my image is gone, I feel like it doesn't matter to hear my voice. <laughs> right. Daniela, we have about 10 minutes left. I know you had some questions for Victoria and we're curious about a few things. Did you want to jump in? Well, I, I think, um, Victoria, you just answered the questions uh, with the last uh, couple of sentences you said. But uh, I I remember that, um, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to ask you about the sound because it did change at some point, didn't it? I mean, I... I I know, I mean, I when when we were uh, starting, of course, the coronavirus was, as you said, already there, um, but it didn't get serious. I mean, I think we were the only two persons in the whole museum that were not, oh, three, yes, you were two. When we were, uh, Monica was two, when we were working together, we were the only ones um, not giving the hand, but uh, the, the, the elbows to say hello. And I remember even people, even scientists from the museum, like kind of laughing at that gesture, you know, like, ah. so 
I know that this this COVID data that you gathered for the sound, it's something new. Before you had something else. Why why did you change it? And uh, the the other question about it would be what kind of data of COVID data are you gathering um, to do this sound? So yes, it's changed drastically. You know, I'm actually very interested uh, in vibrations and frequencies, whether they're rhythmic of our bodies or our brains or in relation to our environment, noise, etc. And I've being a kind of a site specific, we did bring in different cultural sounds and vibrations. Uh, but once it became an online meditation where people from different locations were going to, first of all, join together to create this vibratory field. And then second, to uh, have others who voluntarily feel the magnet to join it then becomes very much a mental vibration that's going through the networks. And the idea of raising the frequency and creating some kind of coherence between like-minded people to shift from the destructive frequencies of all kinds of noise, whether you're talking about media and fake news or you know machines or uh, war, etc. To, to have a different type of frequency of people coming together that's non-denominational, that has nothing to do with a particular religious practice, but it's just uh, through art and science and actual factual data, converting it into a way that we can together collectively shift consciousness became a real, um, urgency for me. So immediately the, cha the the sound became the critical part. The visuals, of course, they're seductive, they're beautiful, and they're meant to pull you in and hold you in because we are visual culture. We're in a visual culture, let's put it that way. And visuals come first. And, you, and especially if you're looking at a screen, you'll get distracted very quickly. So to create fantastic visuals as we did, of course is important, but they were they were pretty much in place. What became a real a deliberate work with Paul Geluso and the whole team is really to think about how do we create a healing frequency with the drone sound and the harmonics. And even when you enter into the, the piece as a meditation, uh, I was saying to Paul, you know, what I would like to do is first introduce each sound that as people get into the project and into the meditation collectively, they're able to identify the destructive sound that they're going to then hold on to the drone sound. So we're going to show them one by one. And he said, oh, that's exactly like Indian ragas. Before they start the concert, they introduce every instrument and then the the concert starts and it goes on and on and the people participate with chanting. And this became so exciting to me, just the thought of recreating the way we're thinking and working together and how we work with sound. I'm also teaching a class for graduate students this year, which is starting next week. It's all about frequencies and vibrations. And I've noticed even in with students, there's like a need for some kind of sense of support when we're all segregated into our separate environments. Um, and then to answer your question about the COVID data, we go directly into looking. At, so the performance that was a month ago would be have different frequencies from now because we move from country to country how many people have uh, died. And so you actually are getting that kind of data that's processed in, into sound um, through MIDI. So it's, it's um, deliberately a little bit anxiety ridden because it's also trying to point that you have to learn or we collectively have to learn how to deal with all the noise and whether it's visual or auditory and this invisible noise of, well, I call it noise, but this invisible 
horrible tragedy that's happening so now we're hitting millions of people is something that we're all collectively aware of and i know monica's working with collective trauma that's what we're experiencing now so to work as um artists who are conscious of frequencies and vibrations and waves and colors and not make it all just, oh, it's nice, let's just run away from reality. But no, how do we deal with the complexity and the noise? And how do we stay centered and are in that sense are able to survive and respond correctly? Because if you, if you get caught up in the noise, you could get sick or you could, you know, you could get in a pretty dangerous situation. So it kind of helps with the intuitive level, if that makes sense. So it really is like a training. That was something I noticed the first time about uh, when we, when I sat with the meditation was how intense it was. Um, it's not necessarily what someone would um, think of when they think of a meditation, which is very calming. Um, it was very powerful. So we have about one minute left uh, before we have to say goodbye. Victoria, is there anything that you want to say to wrap things up or Daniela? I would just like to take a minute and express my gratitude to both of you, actually, and, and to say how you give me hope, you know, to see the younger generation that's taking on the reins of okay, let's do something collectively and organizationally. And you're doing so much. It's really very exciting to me. And I feel honored to have worked with you and to see you go where you're going. It's really beautiful to me. Um, you're organizing these events, you're teaching, you're active with your own work, and you're collaborating and also basing all the work on facts and deep deep learning and um, research, art-based research that's based on facts and science. And that's wonderful. And I thank you so much for including me. Thank you, Victoria, for, for being a part of, of it all, uh, of this complex system that we are right now, and for being here and for teaching us as well you're 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 an amazing te teacher thank you thank, thank you Victoria. thank you to, and uh you can also put the link to the meditation if somebody is interested to take a look after the fact we will we will put every link to your projects and right. meditations and everything uh, on our web page thank you very much and thank right. you monica Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>